a graduate student here in the astronomy program at Caltech. So quickly, um, I'd like to just go over the format of this event. So there will be a 30-minute lecture given by Ann Medling tonight, followed by 90 minutes of question and answer session in here, and 90 minutes of stargazing outside. So you are free to go in between the lecture indoors and the outside stargazing area throughout that entire 90-minute period. So in terms of observing, um, it's pretty clear tonight. So we hope that we'll have good visibility in terms of looking at the Pleiades, um, Orion, and we'll also be pointing telescopes likely at the moon, which is also always a bright target. Um, you may have noticed when walking in, we have a bunch of swag out in the front. We have some flyers advertising upcoming events and just cool you know, things with pretty pictures of galaxies on them. Um, there are also surveys, so if you have the time while you're here, we encourage you to fill them out just to give us an idea of how you heard about this and what brought you to our event. So I'd like to remind you very briefly that there is no food or drinks allowed in the auditorium, and the stargazing session will be out on the field, which is made of uh, astroturf. So unfortunately, there are no high heels allowed on there. It will poke holes in them, and then the athletics department will become very upset at us and may not let us continue this nice stargazing session. So please keep that in mind. Um, so after the lecture, you will be able to follow the signs outside to the telescopes. They should be bright and blinking and glowing. There are also a bunch of telescope volunteers and people like myself that will help guide you there. Um, we are wearing all of these badges that glow nicely, just like this. So our upcoming events, um, other than this one, are Astronomy on Tap, which I don't know if some of you have heard of. Unfortunately, that's only 21 and over since it's hosted at a local bar here in Pasadena, Der Wolpskopf. But it's an informal setting where you can drink and learn about astronomy. Um, our next lecture of this kind is on February 23rd. It's called Galaxies Aren't Great at Making Stars. So if you're interested in learning about galaxies and star formation, please consider attending that event. So our lecturer today, Ann Medling, is a Hubble postdoctoral fellow here at Caltech. Before she was here with us at Caltech, she was a visiting fellow at Australian National University. She got her PhD from UC Santa Cruz and was an undergrad here at Caltech, so she ended up coming back to us in the end. Um, during her PhD, she worked on looking at the centers of galaxies that were um, nearly complete in terms of mergers and were also very gas rich. And so now, at, during her time at Caltech, she continues and builds on that work by looking at black hole growth during these very gas rich merger events. So today she'll be talking to you about what a merger in our own galaxy might look like in the very distant future. Okay, thank you everyone, um, and thanks Ivana. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and you know, thank you all for coming. Um, can you hear me? Okay, good. So uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what happens when galaxies collide. Uh, so this here is a picture of the mice, which is a, an excellent example of a nearby galaxy merger. So you can see here's one galaxy and another galaxy, and they're in the process of this giant train wreck collision. Um, so it turns out that galaxies colliding with other galaxies is actually pretty common in uh, sort of cosmic history since the beginning of the universe. So if we want to know uh, how a galaxy got to be the way it is today, we need to understand what might have happened as it went through these kind of merger events in the past. Um, so before I get talking about galaxies, I want to step back and take a little bit of time to set the context, because these are the universe's largest collisions, and uh, scales in space are really, really, really big. Uh, so first we'll sort of step back and think uh, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The Earth, this is us, the Sun. Uh, it's about 93 million miles, or 150 million kilometers. Um, so think about that, but that's actually what we might call eight light minutes. So the distance that light can travel in eight minutes. 
Um, so if we step out to the edge of the solar system, um, now I've just zoomed in, out such that Earth is within this red dot that's labeled the sun. You see some of the outer planets here, and these green objects are Kuiper Belt objects. To the edge of the Kuiper Belt, it's about 7 billion kilometers, which is about six and a half light hours. So the distance that light can travel in six and a half hours. Um, so stepping out a little further, I hope you all know that we are uh, in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so we are right about here in this artist's impression of the galaxy. So the distance between us and the center of our Milky Way galaxy is about 26,000 light years. So we were talking about light minutes and light hours. Now imagine how much, very much further it is that light can travel in not just one year, but thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Um, so uh, if you have been to a dark sky site, uh, you might have seen the Milky Way. So this is a panorama taken in the southern hemisphere. And you can see the Milky Way disk. So this is showing the whole panorama of the sky around. And so uh, the Milky Way might show up from one, uh, one part of the sky all the way to the opposite side. So high up in the sky, you see this disk. Um, we see here these clouds of dust that are obscuring our view to the center of the galaxy. Um, but you see also just quite a lot of extra light that comes from how very many more stars there are in the direction of the center of the galaxy. Um, so you can tell this is taken in the southern hemisphere because we see here the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, they are actually two small galaxies that are satellites of the Milky Way, and they are falling in. Um, so if you ever go to the Southern Hemisphere, you should take a look at them. Um, so thinking a little bit about the structure of the Milky Way, we have a disk here and a bulge, uh, and then a stellar halo. So the disk is usually uh, contains gas, and then stars are usually for new stars are formed in the disk. Bulge is sort of older stars, and it's sort of more spheroidal rather than flattened like a pancake. Um, and of course, in the center of our galaxy, we have a supermassive black hole. It's about four million times the mass of our sun. And the distance from one end to the other of our galaxy is about 100,000 light years. OK, so stepping out a little further uh, to the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest neighbor massive galaxy. It's kind of similar to the Milky Way uh, in that it also has a bulge here and a disk of stars. It even has some satellite galaxies that are falling into it. Um, so it is about two and a half million light years away. Um, so again, several orders of magnitude further away. Uh, and it's approaching us at about 75 miles per second. Um, so yes, that means that Andromeda and the Milky Way will most likely collide. Um, but if you've done the math real quickly in your head, it turns out it's going to collide in about 4 billion years. So I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Uh, but, you know, for curiosity's sake, uh, we might want to think about what will happen. Um, so the first thing, of course, what we want to know is what might happen to Earth. Uh, and the first answer is really, galaxies are so empty uh, that probably nothing will happen. Um, so collisions of galaxies don't mean that the actual individual stars or planets or anything inside of them necessarily collides. Uh, so one way to think about this is to imagine two really unpopular sports teams. Uh, so each team maybe only sells one ticket to one very cute fan. Um, if they are playing each other, they don't really have to keep track of uh, which tickets they sell. Because in their very large stadium, you have just one random seat sold over here, one random seat sold over there. So the odds that they would sell the same ticket to each of their one individual fans is really, really low. So the same thing is kind of true if you take galaxies. They're so empty that the odds that putting the superimposing two on top of each other that any stars would collide is really low. So we don't have to worry about the sun. It will be fine. Uh, Earth might be fine, too. Um, the solar system will probably get flung out to another part of the galaxy uh, because of the dynamical torques that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the sun will probably have destroyed the Earth by the time this happens. So Earth really doesn't have to, uh, to worry about anything. Well, it doesn't have to worry about Andromeda. Okay. 
Uh, so even so, we might want to think about what happens uh, when galaxies merge. And so it's obviously really hard to predict all of the detailed stuff that ha goes on during this merger because there's all sorts of physics that goes on. There's not just gravity, which becomes uh, complicated because there are so many different pieces of the galaxy that each are exerting their gravitational forces. Uh, but there's also a lot of other uh, physics that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, hydrodynamics, all the gas that's sloshing around uh, during these galaxy mergers. New stars are forming. Um, there's feedback, which we'll talk about again uh, later as well. Uh, so we just, I'll start by saying we know that galaxies change a lot during a merger. And one reason why we know that is from simulations. Uh, so computer simulations that say, what do you think will happen if we take two galaxies and we smash them together? So the earliest simulations looked at gravity only. We basically say each little particle of mass in a galaxy exerts force on all the other little particles of gas. Uh, so this simulation here uh, from the early 90s is showing what happens when two disky galaxies smash into each other. So you can see that they uh, sort of tear each other apart into streams, and then in the end they sort of fall back in on each other into this sort of more spheroidal thing. Uh, so one really interesting thing uh, is that you might notice this time units up here in the top right corner. And as it steps through these time steps, it's in units of 250 million years. So the whole simulation from the beginning of the merger to the end actually covers about a billion years. OK, so um, we talked a little bit about the structure of the Milky Way. Remember, we have this bulge and we have this disk. Uh, so in the course of a major galaxy merger, uh, we can reshuffle the stars that are in the disk from orbits that are uh, sort of ordered in the rotation of this disk to orbits that are more randomly distributed out in the spheroidal bulge. So we might destroy the disk, and we might build up uh, the bulge. So before I go on, I want to give you a little primer of what galaxies, normal galaxies, look like. So this is called the Hubble tuning fork because it's shaped uh, like a tuning fork. Uh, and so Hubble took galaxies that uh, looked different and decided to put them along this to show some kind of classification or evolution. So these ones on the right here are spiral galaxies. And as you move to the left, uh, these disky blue components where stars are being formed uh, decrease, and then we get more and more of these random spheroidal orbits. So these elliptical galaxies here on the left are what we call uh, red and dead galaxies, because they aren't forming stars anymore. So galaxy mergers are one scenario in which you can take a galaxy that's on the right and move it to the left. OK, so now moving into more pretty pictures, which is the reason we're all here. Um, so I'll just show you some examples of some uh, very spectacular galaxy mergers in the nearby universe. Most of these are images that are taken uh, from space telescopes, like uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so here, again, you can see one galaxy very separate from the other galaxy. Uh, they each have these spiral arms, uh, but they might not forever. Uh, here's another example of a galaxy. This time, rather than being merging face on, one of them is uh, rotated. We also can end up with these spectacular tidal features, like in the Antenna Galaxy. Um, this galaxy is called the Tinkerbell Galaxy, for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, this is NGC 6240. OK, so looking at all these different examples of galaxy mergers, uh, one thing an astronomer might ask is, well, you know, how are these the same? What features are present in all of these galaxy mergers that could be uh, related to the fact that we have a merger? Um, so I think maybe the first most obvious thing that you might think when looking at all these different pictures is that they have all these strange shapes. So the, the strange loops and streams and warps. Um, so really, they're undergoing probably these major structural changes. They're going from what they looked like before to what they will look like after, which uh, you, know, you might not know what that is in advance, but it will probably be different than what it used to be. 
Uh, the other thing that you might notice is that we see a lot of uh, interesting bright colors in these images. The colors themselves are false, uh, but we do as astronomers look at specific wavelength ranges of light to tell us things about uh, what's going on. And so one of the things that we know from looking at these, uh, all these sort of bluer colors, uh, show young stars, young hot stars. So in these examples, we have a lot of new star formation that's going on. And then the other thing that you might notice is that we have dusty red centers in a lot of these galaxies. So that's something that goes along with a lot of gas that's in the center. The dust uh, goes along with the gas. And so it can block uh, light, just like we saw in the earlier picture of the Milky Way seen through our sky. Um, so we see ways in which all of these galaxies are the same, but the other thing that we want to think about is why are they so different? If they're all mergers and they're all the same processes, uh, you know, obviously you wouldn't confuse them with each other. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why they don't look the same. Uh, it could be something as simple as they're all at different stages of merging. So if we just started at the beginning and ordered them, maybe, you know, maybe this one would turn into this one, would turn into this one, would turn into that one. Uh, but it could be that the two original galaxies that started in each of these mergers look different. Um, we can't rewind to look at the beginning because remember these mergers are all taking place over hundreds of millions of years. Um, and then it could also be that you know the the collision path of the galaxies is different and maybe that matters. Uh, so how are we supposed to figure out what's going on? Because collisions take so long I'm not going to wait around to see what happens next. Uh, so what we usually do is we, in order to construct a picture, so we try to look at many, 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 many different galaxies that are undergoing these processes, and we try to set them up in a time order to understand uh, sort of the range of variability that different mergers at each stage might look like. Um, so one example of a group that's doing this is here at Caltech, the GOALS Great Observatory All Sky LURG Survey. Uh, LURG is just an astronomy acronym for Luminous Infrared Galaxy, which uh, suffice to say is all of these. Um, so uh, GOALS is headquartered next door at IPAC, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center. And one of the things uh, that we do is combine observations of these nearby galaxy mergers uh, taken with all of the coolest observatories that we can get our hands on across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so for example, these are some of the the great observatories that went into the name, these space-based observatories like Spitzer in the infrared, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in optical light or the visible light that we could see. Uh, Galax looks in ultraviolet light, which is bluer than blue. And then Chandra X-ray Observatory, which actually just looks at the X-ray light that comes from these galaxies. Uh, so another very exciting thing is that uh, our group has been awarded uh, a James Webb Space Telescope early release science proposal. Um, so that's really exciting because the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which will hopefully launch in 2019, uh, is uh, going to look not just in the infrared like Spitzer, but uh, it's much, much larger, and it's going to give us extremely interesting data. So the early release science proposals uh, the director selected 13 of the most exciting to the community proposals to look at immediately. So these are ones that we can demonstrate the quality of the instrument and that are so interesting to such a wide range of astronomers uh, that it was worth doing them straight away. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope, I really encourage you uh, to go home and look on YouTube uh, for the video Top 5 Awesome Things About the Webb Telescope. Uh, it's worth your four minutes. Okay, um, so with all of these observations and, and many others, uh, we've started to build a picture of what goes on uh, in, in galaxy mergers. So I've already talked a little bit about how spiral galaxies, these disky galaxies, as they merge, they can end up turning into elliptical galaxies. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other things that happen. Um, so this here is a sequence. Uh, they aren't actual images from the universe, but they are uh, simulations, computer simulations. Um, so we start out with these disky galaxies, and as they go through, they end up with this sort of elliptical gas core. 
uh, galaxy. Um, so when these disky galaxies collide, uh, because of gravity, the gas is actually funneled into the center, first of individual galaxies, and then uh, eventually into the, the coalesced combined nucleus. And as the gas funnels into the center, we end up with these dense cores of gas, and dense gas can cool, and cool gas can form stars. So we end up with a lot of this extra star formation in the centers of these galaxies. Uh, and then we also end up with a lot of gas uh, extra to fuel the central black holes. Um, so that is all well and good, but it's more complicated than that because new stars are very hot, and then they can in turn feed back and heat the gas around it. So I said cold gas forms stars, but then stars heat up the gas, so then the gas might form less stars. So it's a sort of feedback process. And the same is true for the black hole accretion. As gas funnels itself onto the black hole, it can heat up, and then it's harder for uh, more of that gas to accrete onto the black hole. So this feedback process is what uh, turns this gas from cold blue in this color scheme to this warmer pink and hot yellow. And so this process of uh, blowing out the gas. So we don't just heat up the gas, but we might actually physically eject it. Uh, and then after we either use it up or we heat it up or we blow it out, we're left with this red and dead elliptical galaxy. Uh, so I'll show you this simulation now. Um, showing two galaxies. So the two left panels show what the gas is doing, and the two right panels show what the stars are doing. And then we just have a face-on view on the top and an edge-on view on the left, on the bottom. And so, as you can see, as we go through, we're starting to heat up the gas in the central regions of these galaxies. We have these tidal streams, which might still be cold. And then as they collide, you can see this extra ejection, these shells being blown out of all the gas, and we're left with this sort of gas pore region. And if you look, if you were watching also the stars, we started out with these disky rotating galaxy uh, galactic disks, like here, and they end up in these more spheroidal, more spherically symmetric, uh, randomly rotating uh, or randomly orbiting stellar populations. Um, so we'll just watch it again because it's cool. <laughs> okay, so you might notice that uh, these pictures here kind of look different from the images that I was showing you before. And so you might ask, well, how can we be sure that uh, we're doing a good job? Or how do we take those images and match them up with simulations like this to see you know, how do we know if it's an early stage or a late stage merger? Um, so now I'm going to show you a movie um, that compares simulations with observations. So this is a different, uh, a different simulation, but what it does is it takes different stages of the simulation and moves the camera around to show us matched images of actual observed galaxies. Um, so you can see examples of what it might actually look like. And it actually does a pretty neat job. Um, so once you believe your simulations, which are usually simulated with mass, 
right? We have little particles. We say there's this much stars here. We know uh, how much gravity they, gravitational forces they exert because we know how massive they are. Uh, then what we have to do is compare them to the galaxies we actually observe, but we measure light instead of mass, right? So our telescope just tells us this galaxy is this bright in these colors, and we have to try to translate uh, what that looks like. So in our simulations, we usually, uh, you know, simulations like this, we say, okay, well, mass, more mass means it's brighter, or maybe we can say that it's brighter with these colors, things like that. Um, but one of the things that we have to think about is also dust. So I've talked about this a couple of times, but dust that is in these galaxies uh, can actually change what we see. So it can block out some of the light, and it can also uh, make it look redder because uh, the gas itself, or the, the dust itself, can be warm and then uh, radiate in, in red. So in this example of a galaxy, these reddish clumps here show dust. So if we're comparing our observations, our images of galaxies that have all this dust to our simulations, which don't, uh, then we start to run out of uh, easy ways to compare it. Um, so instead, our simulations, what they do is uh, often they try to look and say, well, we think we know what the distribution of dust might look like, so let's try to simulate what not just uh, what our mass profile is in the simulations, but then what the light uh, ought to look like. Uh, so what I'm going to show you now is a, a merger that basically uses this reprocessing technique in order to simulate what it actually would look like. So if you had time to read that, this blue bits, the blue bits are uh, sort of the younger stars. And you can see as this collision uh, progresses, we have a lot more of these colors that might look a little bit more qualitatively similar to the observations that we had taken from our space telescopes. So you can see bluer star forming, uh, star formation going on in these spiral arms that's been spun up by the gravitational interaction. And then as they collide, we see all this, this dust uh, starts to make the nuclear region redder, and we can see these tidal streams. There's even some satellite galaxies, tidal dwarf galaxies that are falling in. Um, so now it's just going to spin the galaxy remnant around at the end of the merger, and you can see this really beautiful dust lane right about there. Um, so actually, putting together simulations like this is one of the relatively recent uh, advances that really uh, makes a difference in understanding uh, how to compare simulations and observations. Um, so I'll just finish by bringing us back to this Andromeda merger, um, which we know not to be worried about. Um, it will change everything, but uh, not, not for the worse. Um, but you might ask, well, what would it look like if Earth were here, uh, were still here, and if we were still on Earth or on some Earth-like planet? Um, and so this is a series of images that are, are sort of composite images that uh, predict what it might look like. So starting on the top left, this is just what you would see right now in a really dark sky site that's looking towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Or, and then here, as Andromeda comes closer, first it would just look bigger on the sky. So uh, on a dark night here, you can see the Andromeda galaxy um, with your naked eye if you're really, if you're really good or uh, with small binoculars for sure. Uh, so as it comes closer, it would start to become more and more obvious. As it gets very close, it becomes sort of comparable on the sky with our own Milky Way. And then as they start to undergo this cosmic dance, uh, 
destructive dance, then you end up uh, sort of messing up this clear disk, and you end up with just a whole bunch of stuff uh, at the end where we have this elliptical thing. So instead of looking at the center of the Milky Way where we can see a band of star formation and maybe clouds of dust uh, with different regions looking a little bit different because we have sort of clouds of star formation, clouds of dust, uh, and spiral arms. Instead, we just have this elliptical, boring, uh, spheroidal, unchanging, uh, unchanging region of the sky. But the sky would probably look a lot brighter. Uh, so uh, with that, thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and take any questions. Okay, all right, I hope everyone enjoyed the lecture. So we have um, time for a couple quick questions right now. Yes? Um, sure, a little bit. So uh, basically, these, um, let's see. See if I can get a beautiful picture of a spiral arm so we can talk about it. I'm just going to skip all the way back to. Way back to the beginning. Like this one. Okay, so uh, if you have a thin disk of gas. Um, so this is looking face on, but you can also imagine it edge on, so everything's spinning. Uh, basically, these uh, spiral arms are, as you said, uh, density waves. So basically, they're, these are region, denser regions um, where there are more stars or more gas. Uh, so this is what we call an instability. So basically, if you um, if you were to spin, um, I don't know, like a, a plate full of water, you could form these kinds of instabilities. So basically, it might start with uh, just a little, uh, a little wave somewhere, and then it ends up being able to sort of trail in the spiral arms. So it's something that comes out naturally of gravity and fluid dynamics. Uh -huh. yeah. um, if Earth was still around, um, and, it, and um, it was caught in, in the bouncing Earth, what would happen to it? Um, probably nothing except we'd get a really good show in the night sky if we waited around a long time. Uh, we'd, if the sun didn't destroy us, we'd probably still be around the sun, and probably the sun you know, would do just fine except our nearest neighbor might not be our nearest neighbor anymore. So we get a little bit shuffled around. Yeah. Uh, so during the early part, earlier part of the collision, um, star formation spikes up. Um, so is, is it the case that um, the galaxies have a certain amount of, a certain amount of energy they can burn creating stars, and it just uses up that energy faster? Uh, yeah, that's a really good that's a really good question. So, essentially, there's this limited pool of material that we can use to form stars, and so it is true that sort of these merger might jumpstart that. So, it's not exactly true because we think that galaxies can still accrete new gas, new fuel from uh, sort of the what they call the circumgalactic medium. So, stuff outside our galaxy can slowly fall into our galaxy, but that's at a limited rate, and so it might stall star formation for a long time. And it's also possible that uh, that galaxy might be in a place where it's not accreting any more galaxy, in which case, uh, any more gas, in which case it's sort of out of luck. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be um, questions. Okay, everyone. So we're going to get the question and answers panel started. So. Um, 
we're going to just have everyone introduce themselves briefly and go over what their area of expertise is so you know who to direct your questions to. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Kishle. I am a grad student here at Caltech um, in astronomy. I work on different kinds of instruments and telescopes. Uh, my research interests are in various kinds of cosmic explosions and the kind of remnants that you get from cosmic explosions. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Nikita. I'm also a grad student here at Caltech, and my area of research expertise is supermassive black holes, which I study using an X-ray telescope called NuSTAR. Hi, my name is Marianne. I'm a postdoc here at Caltech, also in the X-ray group, um, but I mainly study like not supermassive black holes and neutron stars that are interacting with their stellar companions. So, do we have our first question? Yes? Uh, hi, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere that uh, there's roughly 2 trillion galaxies in the observable universe. If that's the case, there should be a lot of uh, galactic binaries out there. And if they merge, <coughs> I would imagine there's a massive black hole that will also merge. Is there any, do we have any hope of ever seeing that event? Okay, so the question is, given the sheer amount of galaxies in the observable universe, which is around, I believe, 100 billion, um, is there any likelihood that we would observe a, a merger of supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies? Um, right, so um, I guess your reference was to the merger event, the exi exciting merger event that we saw last year, which was a merger of two neutron stars, which was observed by gravitational wave observatories, and we also saw it in that romantic light. But as it turns out, because these supermassive black holes are so big and so heavy, the timescales involved in these mergers are significantly larger than what we see in neutron stars. So neutron stars, if you uh, remember, are, um, have a mass of about a solar mass and a radius of about you know, a city radius, a few tens of kilometers. and um, the supermassive black holes are much bigger, so they're not directly observable with the kind of gravitational wave detectors that we have on Earth. Uh, instead, what you can use to observe these mergers are, it's an indirect way of detecting gravitational waves. It's called pulsar timing arrays. So just to um, give you a brief intro into pulsars, so, um, so we know that when massive stars die at the end of their lives, they die in explosions, and those explosions produce neutron stars. And it turns out that neutron stars are these extremely stable clocks. So they are these rotating stars that emit radiation. And you can, because, the, so it's like a lighthouse. If you have a rotating star with a beam, beam coming out of the star, you can basically observe the same effect as you see in a lighthouse. You'll see a blip, 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 blip. You'll see, keep seeing this as long as you want. And it turns out that you can use neutron stars, the, the arrival times of these pulses, as extremely stable clocks. These neutron stars do turn out to be extremely stable over very long periods of time. And so if you have, say, um, a merger of two very massive black holes, you'd expect that these gravitational waves would induce very small perturbations on the arrival times of these pulses, simply because these pulses also travel through the same space that um, these gravitational waves travel through, and you would expect some kind of anomaly, some kind of deviation from the exact time that you would expect these pulses to arrive. And this is the exact point of using pulsars as extremely stable clocks in what are known as pulsar timing arrays. So the idea is that if you use, observe a number of pulsars all around the sky, you should be able to see very small correlated, by correlated I mean deviations that are somehow related across different parts of the sky. And these would tell you something about the kind of gravitational waves that exist in the background. So that is a hope. It's not been achieved yet. And that's primarily because we are still trying to achieve the kind of sensitivities required to achieve the precision that we need to detect these gravitational waves. But we are definitely on the right track right now. 
So whether or not pulsar timing arrays will ever work, I mean, I'm assuming they will, but they've been promising this for like 10 years. Um, but what we will get is LISA, the laser interferometer in space, which is basically, um, it's the same principle as LIGO and Virgo, except it's going to be in space, which means uh, instead of a base length of like baseline of a few kilometers, they will have like 150 million kilometer baseline. And with these interferometers, the sort of, what I learned as like a um, sort of a figure of like a, as a scaling way is that the size of your interferometer decides, determines the size of the events you can see. So with a couple kilometers, you can see things that are a couple kilometers across, like merging neutron stars and merging stellar mass black holes. If you have 150 million kilometers, you can see stuff that's 150 million kilometers across, which is like uh, binary white dwarfs, but also uh, merging supermassive black holes. So LISA, once, it's, once it flies, and it probably will in, I think, 2034, um, we'll definitely see these things. And just <laughs> another addition, we can also see these, we, we don't see the mergers themselves, but we do uh, observe binary supermassive black holes. So when the galaxies merge, it takes a while for the black holes themselves to merge because the, the galaxies merge and in that process the, the, both the supermassive black holes will sort of fall to the center of the new system and they will form a binary supermassive black hole. And we don't, we're not entirely sure how long it takes for that, for that, for that binary to actually merge, um, but we do see very close supermassive black hole pairs that are somewhere on the way to, to being a very, very close binary and eventually merger. So more questions? Yes? Uh, if you know how supermassive will mass black hole even form, why is that that there is trouble to figure out how they get that, that large? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, how do supermassive black holes get as massive as they do? And I guess you're probably referring to the amount of time, that there hasn't been a whole lot of time in the universe for this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's still very much an open area of research and a lot of different hypotheses have been proposed for how you get growth of supermassive black holes um, very early on in the universe and, you know, some ideas that have been proposed are the idea of these primordial black holes. So um, the kind of generally accepted um, idea of galaxy formation is that um, galaxies form within these dark matter halos and um, you can basically have direct collapse of um, basically over dense regions to form very massive black holes which then just continually accrete over time to become supermassive. Um, there are other ideas proposed that um, supermassive black holes could have um, been developed from a certain type of um, populations of massive stars called POP3 stars. Um, but again, yeah, it's a very active area of research. And um, I personally work on um, active galactic nuclei, which are supermassive black holes which have an accretion disk around them, so they're very luminous. And, um, you know, another big area is that we're finding more and more distant um, accreting supermassive black holes that have formed very early on in the universe. So, yeah, it's still very much an open question. Okay, so the question is, how exactly do we observe these collisions of, uh, or, oh, the, or the binaries in general in galaxies? Um, yeah, so it's tricky. Um, there are a few, a very few cases where, um, so what Nikita said, she works on active galactic nuclei, and, and those are supermassive black holes that are actively feeding um, which means they're bright usually in x-rays and radio. Um, there are a few instances of uh, dual active galactic nuclei in a galaxy where you can see that the galaxy clearly has gone through a merger recently. 
and there are actually two bright X-ray sources in the center or two bright radio sources in the center. Um, of course, the resolution of those techniques is limited, so you will mainly see the pairs that are not very close in yet, because then you will just see it as a single source. Um, and then there are claims of um, basically what people look for is, for if you want to look for the very close pairs, so the ones that we can't separate anymore with our current telescopes, um, they look for um, periodicities in the light curves. So um, basically because these things are moving around each other, one of them is maybe brighter than the other, you will see uh, modulations in the, in the optical light, so it will be like a wavish waveform. And people have been looking for those in like very large collections of like years long uh, light curves of quasars and at some point there was a claim like they found like hundreds. But it's like a, it's like a, it's like a sinusoid. No, that's years. They're very, they're, they're pretty long. Um, but most of those claims actually turn out to be, well, not real. They're, it's just sort of coincidental. Once you have enough light curves, there will be a few that will look like a wave thing, especially if you're looking at like one or maybe two periods. You think you're seeing something that's periodic, but it really isn't. Um, but there are a few that may stand the test eventually. Okay, so the question is, given how much um, extinction there is due to the presence of dust near the center of galaxies, um, what sort of techniques do we use to actually learn about the centers? Right, so I can answer part of that question, which is, um, so I'll talk about the infrared. Uh, so, um, right, so it turns out that, so the, if you look at a source which, with a lot of material that is in between you and the source, the absorption itself is a very strong function of what frequency you're observing at. So our eyes are uh, sensitive between wavelengths of about, um, say about 400 to uh, 900 nanometers. So nanometers, so that's really small. So these are the typical wavelengths of light that our eyes are sensitive to. There are, but there are other wavelengths that are observable from ground and, uh, and as, uh, of course from space where we do see a lot of emission from these astrophysical sources. And it turns out that if you go to longer and longer wavelengths, the absorption becomes less and less prominent. So if you want to look at any part of the galaxy or anywhere in general with a lot of absorption, the, the region you want to observe in is in the infrared. So the infrared is wavelengths that are longer than what the human eye is sensitive to. Uh, so these are typically could be you know, a few thousand nanometers, which is well, a few microns. Um, and uh, so the current ways that we observe the center of the galaxy is primarily in the infrared. And the way you do that is that you take a big telescope like the ones that you know, Caltech operates and so on, and you, you can use um, big telescopes in the infrared bands with detectors that are sensitive to this infrared light. Our eyes are not sensitive to infrared light at all. So you don't see any infrared emission from the galaxy. But there are detectors that and telescopes that can see infrared light and use this, these infrared instruments to look at the center of the galaxy and that has in fact produced remarkable results in the last decade with, you know, where we now, with, with, with these infrared observations, we can trace out orbits of individual stars around the center of the galaxy. And that in fact is one of the strongest pieces of evidence that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So that has been quite a result that has been possible only with infrared observations. Yeah, and then if you go the other way um, towards the, the X-rays, they also basically uh, they don't care much about the dust. So, like what we call soft X-rays can still be absorbed, but once you go to like the really energetic ones, they basically just crash through. Um, so that this is a way in which we find um, what are called obscured AGN. So these active galactic nuclei, these are not in our own galaxy. They're like 
distant galaxies. Um, you can find them in different ways, and most of them are found through optical spectra, for example, but if there is a lot of dust in that galaxy, we can't see the optical AGN, so you can still go either to the far infrared or use hard X-rays to actually find those sources. Yes, so, yeah, so um, uh, the question is that um, a galaxy that's face-on or whatever, a system that is face-on is much easier to study than if you have to look through the band of gas, and that is absolutely true. Yes. Although there can still be, even in a galaxy that, is, that we see face-on, if we see the galaxy face-on, doesn't mean we see the supermassive black hole face-on, so there can still be dust really close to the supermassive black hole that's in the way um, and it's actually really fun to study that too. <laughs> so people are now trying to figure out um, what, the, what, what is happening in this area. There's a lot of material close to the supermassive black hole. Some of it is falling into the black hole. Some of it is being blown out. And what's ex what happens exactly, we're not sure yet, but we're getting more and more data in, across all wavelengths. And you need all of it to piece together this whole puzzle. Yeah, just to add to that. Um, you know, there, there has been advancements in X-ray instrumentation that, you know, you can have different types of, um, like different types of X-ray uh, photons, ones which are um, soft, which means that they're more lower in energy, and then hard X-rays are more higher energy. So even if you have sources which are edge-on, um, telescopes like New Star, um, which can focus high energy X-rays, can still pick out these obscured AGN or these obscured supermassive black holes, even if we have a lot of dust because it's still very bright in these high energy X-rays. Whereas other X-ray instruments like say Chandra or XMM-Newton, they're more sensitive to the softer X-rays which are more easily absorbed. Okay, so the question is, where is the momentum um, that's driving Andromeda and the Milky Way together coming from? So um, the plain, simple answer is gravity. <laughs> um, so it turns out that um, gravity is a, is a strong enough force because these are two really big objects, really massive objects. And there is, even though dis the distances are really large, but gravity is an extremely long range force that which is capable of just imparting that momentum it's just pulling the two galaxies together that leads will eventually lead to a collision so so yeah it, the, the answer is gravity yes Okay, I'm gonna, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so, three questions. Why is there so much space between stars? What was the second one? Is it, well, is it due to the formation, the gas? Ah, or, right. And is it also due to black holes? Do they need to be far enough away so they don't get sucked into black holes? Okay, so that's basically one question. I'm gonna okay. treat that as one question. Why is there so much space between stars? And um, the 
third one, which I already forgot. Sorry about that. Oh, Battle of the Bulges. Right. Well, I guess that's sort of related. OK, so um, it's true. The galaxy is really empty in terms of stars. Like there's, for example, the, the distances between galaxies is relatively is much smaller than the distances between stars. Um, uh, but it's, it really depends on where you are, right? If you're in the bulge, in, the, in this, the, 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 the nuclear cluster in the center of our galaxy, it's a lot busier than here. It's still, I mean, stellar collisions, like stars don't usually crash into each other because they are so far apart. Um, but in, in very dense regions, like, uh, like the center of the Milky Way or in globular clusters, uh, where the stars are much closer together, you do get a lot of what we call dynamical interactions. So the stars don't necessarily crash into each other, but they definitely pass, pass close enough to actually um, like <coughs> give momentum to each other. And then sometimes one of the stars gets kicked out of the cluster and stuff like that. So when stars form, they're usually closer together. Um, uh, so in, in um, globular clusters, which we think are formed in sort of one big blob of gas, but also in what we call open clusters, which is places where young stars are forming sort of right now. Um, so they start out together, but because they don't all have exactly the same momentum, they sort of drift apart over the years. So you see that these, these groups of young stars, they're pretty young, and, and uh, if you look at slightly older groups of stars, they'll be more sort of drifted apart already. And then in the, in the grand potential of the Milky Way, it sort of spreads out eventually, I guess. Does that seems reasonable. Okay, and then if you have two galaxies that merge, if they both have a bulge, um, you still, like when our galaxy merges with Andromeda, for example, you still won't get a lot of stellar collisions. Um, so I think the two bulges won't necessarily battle, they will just merge. They will form one bigger bulge and be very happy. <laughs> Yeah, so um, with x-rays, it's very, very difficult to focus at all. New Star is pretty much the only telescope able to bend x-rays, so to speak, and get them to a point focus. Um, most of the x-ray instrumentation that's being used is really like collimators, which are basically tubes that just collect photons, which land on your detector. But with, um, with telescopes like New Star, um, you use these kind of Walter optics, which essentially the physics behind it is that um, for an X-ray photon of a given energy, um, there is a certain critical angle that it will bend or reflect at, and um, that angle will become smaller and smaller as the energy of your photon goes up. And so to try and improve the reflectivity of um, these sort of optics, what essentially you do is you uh, develop these sort of um, multi-layers or bilayer coatings within the optics, which essentially means that you have um, layers of material that's dense and less dense. So you have these alternating layers um, of one type of material and then a spacer of low density material. And essentially what's happening is this um, process called Bragg reflection. And um, this helps to really enhance the reflectivity by having these sort of multi-layer coatings and enable you to bend X-rays and even, you know, higher higher energy X-rays um, like the ones that the New Star Telescope focuses. So, yeah, Bragg reflection is basically the physics behind it. It's, it's a, I've, I've looked at the Chandra uh, yeah. Four parabolic mirrors and then four uh, hyperbolic mirrors. 
Yeah, so I think it probably has more mirrors than that, but what, so an X-ray telescope, can I draw on a whiteboard? Um, I'm going to try and draw this. I don't know, can you see it when I draw it on here? So a normal optical telescope basically will have a mirror like that and the light is coming from there and it sort of reflects into the focal point. But like you said, x-rays will just go straight through. So this does not work for x-rays. This is why it's really easy, theoretically, to build a big optical telescope because you just make the mirror bigger. But x-rays will only reflect on a very shallow angle. So basically what you do is you have a cylinder so here you have to imagine that this is in 3D and it's like a cylinder and an x-ray will come in, hit the edge and then be slightly uh, reflected. Like it will be reflected but at a very small angle. And to avoid having to have a kilometer long telescope because this obviously leads to very long focal lengths, you put another mirror, like you said, another set of mirrors here which will reflect it a little bit further and then this is a little bit exaggerated but this is basically what you do. So you have several sets, like you said, of um, cylinders that are, I think, alternatingly parabolic and, and some other shape. And, and that's how you focus x-rays. But it's difficult. <laughs> and you can imagine, so this way you, you get very little area, collecting area, because you only hit like it's basically only this, right? So your collecting area here is gonna be like this. And that's why they put multiple shells inside each other um, that are basically separate mirrors and they're all focusing in more or less the same point, but this is what makes it really hard to focus them in, in one point, really. Yeah, so this, is, this works with normal glass, I think, for soft x-rays, or maybe it's gold or something. I think they're made of gold. Um, and then if you want to focus the hard x-rays, it's, it's much harder. <laughs> and that's why they develop these, these coatings for, on, for the mirrors that are better at reflecting these hard x-rays. And if you're talking about gamma rays, I don't think anybody has tried to focus gamma rays. That's just uh, not gonna happen anytime soon. In the back? So the question is if we know what happens when two supermassive black holes merge and if they just continue, um, if they just orbit one another or if they end up eventually coalescing to form one object. Um, yes, so like the stellar mass black holes, they will, um, after they form a binary, they will slowly shrink, the binary will slowly shrink, they will sort of fall closer to each other because they lose, um, they actually emit gravitational waves all the time and that carries away momentum and that shrinks the binary. Uh, and eventually they will merge just like the, the stellar mass ones that we saw last year. And then they become one very big black hole. There are actually, well, theories. There's an idea that um, if at the final merger, it depends on, the, on how the black holes are spinning, but um, what you can do is like this final burst of gravitational waves that we will hopefully one day see with our gravitational wave detector in space. Um, if that's sort of non-isotropic, so if more gravitational waves go one way than the other way, then that can sort of kick the black hole because the total momentum has to be conserved, right? So the gravitational waves carry away momentum in one direction and then the new black hole gets kicked in the other direction. And if you tweak everything just right, uh, like have the masses in like the ideal form and have the spins ideally non-aligned, um, you can actually kick a supermassive black hole out of its galaxy. Um, we were looking for these at some point, we never found one, but it's a really cool idea.
Oh, so I guess, oh, okay. Um, can you finish something? Yeah, okay. So uh, there's another exotic idea which is perhaps interesting in this context, which is that, so even though, I mean, not considering the fact that supermassive black holes can themselves be kicked out of their galaxies, but they do have, these binaries can have very significant influences on the stars that are there at the center of the galaxy. And in fact, um, there are ideas that, so we do see um, a certain population of stars which have extremely high speeds moving through the galaxy. So these are called hypervelocity stars because they have hypervelocities. And the idea is that if you have um, binary supermassive black holes and if you have uh, a binary of two normal stars which just gets too close to the binary supermassive black hole, then just because of gravity, one star in that binary can be captured onto that in orbit around that supermassive black hole, whereas the other one will take all that energy and just get kicked out of its host. And that can produce an extremely fast-moving star, which is basically kicked out of its galaxy. And you'll, you know, a few million years later, you'll find it in the in the, in the far outskirts of its galaxy, and so and moving at an extremely high velocity. So yeah, that's another well interesting idea that people have considered. Uh, yes, to my knowledge, yes, there are hypervelocity stars, yes. So uh, they do bring their dark matter in with them. And uh, there are actually very interesting examples of how, so, so, so dark matter does not interact in the way that normal matter interacts. And there are remarkable examples of how we see this observationally in, well, the popular example is uh, known as the bullet cluster, where, so, the, uh, so you can trace the presence of dark matter by what is known as gravitational lensing where the idea is that if you have extremely high concentrations of matter, then you'd see, if you look at a background, very high density background, then you would see that, uh, you'd see the background material being distorted in its light because of the gravitational effects of the matter that is in front of it. And that is something that is uh, possible with any kind of object that has you know, a, a gravitational effect. Whereas all the normal matter would emit in electromagnetic light, the ones that you would act could actually see. So we do have examples of merging galaxies where we basically see that two galaxies merge together and the normal matter which actually interacts you know, via all kinds of electromagnetic processes, they get stalled at some point because they're interacting with each other whereas the dark matter just goes through. So you see that two interacting galaxies where the dark matter has passed through the entire collision whereas the normal matter has just stalled at the point where it is uh, colliding with the, uh, where the two galaxies are colliding. So yes, the dark matter does come in with the merger and they can have really, well, remarkable effects on um, how the morphology of the eventual merger looks like. So I, I've done some work with um, simulations of galaxy formation and evolution. So the number of um, particles, what we call them, you have actually depends on how massive a galaxy you're simulating, for example, and also in something called resolution. So, you know, during Anne's talk, she showed some videos from the early 90s, which would have had very poor resolution in comparison to what we're able to do today, just because of we have much greater computational power. So the better resolution you have, the more particles that correspond to stellar populations or gas clouds you can have. So we do tend to have at, um, at least on the order of millions of these for most normal size galaxies that we're simulating. 
if you have something like a dwarf galaxy, which is like a thousand times less massive than the Milky Way, for example, you're going to have less of these particles that are included in your simulation. Um, did you have a second part of your question? Yeah, so in general, I think that normal Newtonian physics does tend to suffice. So um, what you tend to do is you have this, say, like gas cloud that's represented in your simulation or this stellar population, and um, you find the nearest neighbors that are surrounding it, which um, will influence the way that this particle behaves in the simulation. So we calculate, you know, by pretty standard Newtonian mechanics, um, the gravitational force that this particle will experience as a result of all of its neighbors over some characteristic length scale, if that makes sense. Um, so it also varies depending on the simulation that you're dealing with. Um, so yeah, I don't think um, general relativity tends to become more important, I think, if you're simulating something like just a single soup, um, black hole, for example, or if you would be very interested in a supermassive black hole and potential stars that orbited it, but when we're considering the entire galaxy as a whole, it typically doesn't factor in. So in uh, galaxy evolution simulations, you tend to have, um, you have these gas cloud particles and you have these stellar population particles, but you also have dark matter particles. Um, they tend to be more massive than the star and gas elements that you're having, and they only interact gravitationally, as we alluded to earlier. So between things like uh, the gas clouds in the simulated galaxies are affected by, say, the radiation coming from one of the stellar populations that we're simulating. And the important thing about radiation is that it's a way of actually losing energy and uh, impacting the amount of energy that, say, another gas cloud in the simulation has. But since dark matter doesn't seem to interact um, by means of light, it just uh, comes down to mostly simulating gravitational interaction. So for the dark matter, um, the way simulations tend to work is that you actually simulate them using dark matter only at first. Um, so the thing, when we look back to very early on in the universe, we see something known as the cosmic microwave background, which some of you may have heard of. Um, so what it is is a way of seeing essentially the um, over densities and under densities very early on in the universe that later evolved to form the galaxies that we know today. So if you had an area early on that was a little bit more dense than the nearby area, just by the force of gravity, that area will continue to grow. So we start with what we know about um, the universe very, very early on from this cosmic microwave background you evolve those conditions forward in time to, you know, a certain point within the universe, and then from there, that's where you start the simulation. And these little over-dense clumps of matter, you mostly, you say, this is dark matter. And you see how it grows over time and interacts with other clumps of dark matter. And once that's done, you select um, these dark matter halos, we would call them, these large collections of dark matter and then re-simulate them from you know, that point where the initial conditions of the universe were evolved forward in time, including gas and stars. So dark matter first, and then we add in everything else. So gas and stars are much more complicated to simulate because, again, there are a lot of different electromagnetic processes that you need to consider. So a number of years ago, dark matter-only simulations were the standard, and they, and they tend to be some of the most important things for galaxy growth as a whole. Any other questions? Yeah. Does it come up like when you combine simulations, or is it just, you know, if that makes any sense, like you, you take a dark matter simulation and then you, and you try to figure out these halos and then you sort of uh, also take a simulation merger and, and try to figure out how that's all intertwined or 
Yeah, so the answer, I mean the question, sorry, is if we can combine simulations. So I think what you're getting at is um, what we do is we simulate these dark matter halos in something known as a cosmological box. So something, you know, that's say the size of the entire local group, uh, which contains, say, the Milky Way and Andromeda and all the small galaxies around it, or even larger, depending on the simulation. Um, when you simulate that whole thing, you can simulate systems of galaxies. You know, so you can have some really massive halo where something like the Milky Way will form and these smaller ones, and then you can end up witnessing these mergers. But it's important to actually have a large enough box where you can simulate these things together because one important thing when thinking about galaxy evolution is the effect of what we call environment, the effect of these other galaxies on one another. Um, and it's difficult to know if you're simulating a galaxy completely in isolation, whether or not you actually have an accurate picture of the processes that are driving galaxy formation. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, how does the final mass of the merged supermassive black holes compare in terms of like percentage to the final mass of the merged galaxy object? Um, so you're alluding to this, uh, what we call the, yeah, the, the relationship between the mass of the supermassive black hole, and it's usually not compared to the whole galaxy, but like the bulge, or um, there is this sort of strange relationship between the mass of the supermassive black hole and, and the mass of all the stars in the bulge. And it's not clear why that exists, because the two shouldn't know about each other. I mean, the supermassive black hole is only a tiny fraction of the mass of all the stars. So yes, it does have a sphere of influence gravitationally where it does sort of um, that drive the motion of the stars, but that's only a tiny, tiny fraction of that whole bulge. And the rest of the bulge doesn't care about this black hole. So why is there this relationship? We don't, we actually, we really don't know. And one of the ideas is like, if this is sort of like imprinted early enough um, that every galaxy has this relationship, then if you grow supermassive black holes through mergers, then you will, it, it will remain, right? Because if you have two black holes that are each 5%, say, of the size of their galaxy, then of, of obviously the, the merger will still be 5% of the size of the whole galaxy because that's how that works. Um, yeah, but how this relationship gets there in the first place, we're not sure. There will be a, sm well, a very small and insignificant change in the mass of the black hole simply because there is so much of energy that will be emitted in gravitational waves. So it turns out that when these black holes will be merging, then they will be emitting gravitational waves. And that those gravitational waves will carry, will carry out a certain fraction of the mass of the supermassive black hole away from the system. And in fact, we've seen this very well now in actual merging black holes in LIGO, where we see that the final black hole weighed lesser, well, by, would say, you know, 5%, 10%, whatever. So it's, it's, it's a small effect, but yes, gravitational waves do carry away mass in the form of energy from the merging system. For the most part, it's 1 plus 1 equals 2. Like, yeah, it's not a very big fraction of the total mass of the system. It really depends on what specific topic you're looking for, right? Um, but the book that I like is the one by, um, it's on black holes, by Kip Thorne. Um, and it's called, 
Right, yes, black holes, time warps, and other outrageous things, something like that. Um, I think it has outrageous in the title, I'm not sure. Something like that. And he really, I mean, it's pretty detailed. He goes through some pretty advanced math, but you can skip those parts if you want. And um, it's actually really fun. It's a really, it also gives you the whole history of like how, the, how people even came up with the idea that there may be black holes, because of course it's a little bit crazy. Uh, so he tells the whole story. He was involved in part of it, right? So he, it's, it's really, that's a, I thought that was a fun read. Um, I'm sure Neil deGrasse Tyson has written a book. Well, referring to Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think he recently wrote a book, um, yeah, who don't have like actual time or something to learn about it. So that, <laughs> so that should be a good quick introduction, but it depends on uh, what sort of level you're looking for. But one, I think comprehensive introduction to astrophysics that's more at like a, um, maybe like college level perhaps is astrophysics in a nutshell. I think, yeah, so if, if you want to get into a little bit more of the math and technical details. Well, the same answer, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so people were afraid that the, the super collider at CERN would eventually produce a black hole somehow. Um, there's even a website, has the LHC destroyed the world yet? It just says no, but no, anyway. Um, so even if the LHC would produce a black hole, it would produce a black hole of a mass of two protons, which is very, 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 very low mass. And um, when you get to those low masses, actually Hawking radiation becomes important. It would just evaporate before you would even notice it. So it might, it would be really cool, but we probably won't be able to see it. And it certainly won't destroy the Earth. So um, I study satellite galaxies, specifically um, those nearby to us. So we have a number of them that orbit the Milky Way. And there are also a number of them that orbit the Androm Andromeda galaxy that we can see. So um, there are, I think, at least 25 total or so in the local group as a whole. There are 10 or so that are close to the Milky Way that are pretty well studied. Um, so these galaxies actually end up being eventually incorporated into the much more massive galaxies that they orbit, right? Just because they're, they're drawn to them gravitationally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they tend to be at least like a thousand times less massive, right? So they're nothing compared to uh, the Milky Way, but they, they do make up um, what we call the stellar halo, the outer regions of the Milky Way. So when looking at images of our galaxy, you may have noticed there's this nicely rotating flat component known as the disk that contains all of these really bright blue stars. But the outer region tends to mostly be composed of things that the Milky Way gobbled up from these dwarf galaxies. And you can actually see evidence of dwarf galaxies currently being disrupted. For example, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy is in the process of being destroyed. Um, there's the Sagittarius stream that's visible in the sky. And we can also see these sorts of things in Andromeda. You have um, collections of stars streaking across the sky that are moving together and are a remnant of a dwarf galaxy, you know, that's now being shredded by the gravitational forces. Yeah, yeah, so if you wanna, you can go Google like the Sagittarius stream, for example. Um, and you should come up with images. The one thing that's well studied in Andromeda is known as the, the giant um, southern stream of Andromeda. Yes. Yes. 
So um, they occur on right very long time scales. Um, it usually takes an, a number of different passes for the dwarf galaxy orbiting around before they're actually fully destroyed. Um, but they are an important part of galaxy growth as a whole. Any more questions? Y yep. Right, so it, it is true that uh, when spiral galaxies merge, they become ellipticals. And when elliptical mo ellipticals merge, they still remain elliptical. Uh, so yes, uh, spiral galaxies are in some ways special because they are young galaxies. They f they, even if you look at the light coming from them, most of the light from them is in young stars. So um, wait, uh, so, uh, so what's your question about? Uh, well, yeah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Mergers will lead to elliptical galaxies being formed from spiral galaxies. So the spiral galaxies are special because you only get them in hyperconvergers in the universe. Yes. So it's uh, much more, I guess, difficult to make spiral galaxies, is the point. Because um, in order to have a spiral galaxy, what you need to have is ordered rotation. Um, and ordered rotation? right in in that disk like so it's it's much more stable compared to what you see even in the outer parts of our own galaxy in these ellipticals which is random in comparison you know you have one star like going this way and one star going that way all over the place as opposed to rotating together in a nice plane so it's it's difficult to um for a long time it was difficult to accurately simulate spiral galaxies um because if you, for example, if you had too violent maybe of a merger history in your simulation, you had a bunch of things colliding and things like that. Maybe at the very end, you don't have gas essentially cooling and calming down to form this type of disk. So I think, you know, if, every, if many objects end up merging in the very, very distant future, there could potentially be a time in the universe where you don't see these beautiful spiral galaxies so often anymore. Because it's, uh, you, you can't really go from a chaotic mess back to this nice ordered disk rotation. So yes, on much smaller scales, you had a bunch of tiny, tiny galaxies, even smaller than today's um, dwarf galaxies tend to be, for example, that were merging very early on. Um, so, but that was because everything was much closer to each other early on in the universe. So as the universe continued to expand, you know, and after all of these initial violent mergers occurred early on, there, there was some time in order for galaxies to essentially, you know, stabilize and form these spirals. Did you say this, the barred spirals? Okay, so the question is, what does it take in order for a barred spiral to form? So I think I know the answer, but is anyone else more of an expert? Okay. So um, within these spiral galaxies, there are various um, instabilities that can develop within the disk. So you've got this um, basically balance between the um, gravitational forces and the gas thermal pressure forces, and you can parameterize that. Um, by this tumory Q parameter, essentially. And um, when you're doing, when you're work grinding through the math for this, essentially there are um, 
certain kinds of um, modes of instability. Um, so depending on the kind of instability mode, you can have um, either a bar developing where you have, um, you know, a concentration of um, acceleration, you know, along the plane of the bar in and out, or you can have um, other instabilities developing where you just have a spiral forming with no bar in the center. So it's really, um, uh, it's to do with the instabilities that arise within the disk and and the play, interplay between gravity and um, gas pressure, essentially. Does that answer your question? Or? Um, so what Nikita is trying to explain, I guess, is that if you have, say you start out with a disk of gas that is completely sort of uniform. Um, of course, they're not really, but imagine. Then what happens, I think, uh, this disk rotates and you can have, yeah, so th there are instabilities, which means that if you have a slight overdensity in one place, or the velocity is a little bit different somewhere, you get these sort of patterns in this disk. Um, so the bar isn't even necessarily always, it's, it's not necessarily a super stable feature, it's just, right? Yeah, it's, not it's, it's not stable, it's only temporarily there. I mean, temporarily can still be millions of years, which is enough for us to see it, right? So we don't see it change, but um, they're basically just sort of the, the stars in the disk are moving around. They're not all moving around at the same speed, and that's why some of them will catch up with each other, and some of them won't, or they will lag behind. And that's how, why you see these these features, like the spiral arms and the uh, and the bars. They have to do with like the density of the, the local gas densities. Um, if you have a, a place where the gas density is higher, you will form more stars in that place. So you will see these. That's that's the spiral arms essentially. They're just places where the gas density happens to be higher, so that's where you then form the stars. And in a million years, they may be somewhere else. That's the best I can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, are spiral galaxies generally flat, like more like Yes, they are more. Dis so, what you are. So, the question that you um, need to ask is, you know, how does the height how does the thickness of the disk compare to its radius? Right, and that has to do with the fact that spiral galaxies are formed from ordered rotation. So, so you get rotating disks when you have, you know, a, a, an ensemble like a big sample of stars which are rotating in the same direction in the same way. And that is what characterizes spiral galaxies. Whereas elliptical galaxies have different kinds of star motions. In elliptical galaxies, stars are basically ro like rotate, like, uh, orbiting the center in any random direction. So imagine if you had all stars rotating in the same direction, you'd form something like a disk, which is rotating in the same direction. Whereas if you have a bunch of stars which are effectively moving in any random orientation about the center, you'd get all these kinds of weird orbits. And if you at any given time, if you take a snapshot of that system, you'd see you know, just a big bulge of stars. Even th and that's basically because the stars are moving in random orbits with no preferred axis of rotation. So yeah, that's. Yes, spiral galaxies are special. And they were, uh, as Ivana they're said, rare. yeah, well, they're not rare, but at least in simulations, I believe it was initially difficult to produce spiral galaxies because, you know, ordered rotation is something that, well, is special given that how chaotic the universe is otherwise.
supermassive black hole that might be at the center of these galaxies because of the higher, uh, the higher mass and because of the, uh, the different hydrodynamic things that might be occurring that might be, you know, a greater energy. Right. So the question is if the spirals or the bars that we see in these galaxies, do they, if I understand correctly, do they change in shape or morphology as you get closer and closer to the center of the galaxy? Right. So uh, my understanding is that these spirals actually exist in the relative outskirts because the closer you get to the galaxy, all galaxies, irrespective of whether they're spiral or ellipticals, they have what are known as these central bulges, which is effectively a much more chaotic system of stars which does not really follow the ordered rotation that spirals follow. So the answer is that if you go closer inwards toward in, inner, in, in the inner directions towards the galaxy, then the stellar motions will become more chaotic and you'll see what is known as a bulge, which is effectively, well, an elliptical on a smaller scale. Not, you, don't, you don't see the ordered rotation that you see in the relative outskirts of the galaxy. So you asked about the supermassive black hole and if that affects it, and it's really on the scales where you see the spirals and the bars, they don't care about the supermassive black hole. The supermassive black holes are, I mean, they're massive, but they're not that massive. So say in the Milky Way, for example, our supermassive black hole is what, like three million solar masses? But there's a hundred billion stars in the whole galaxy. So I'm actually not entirely sure how big the bulge is, but let's say it's 1% of the galaxy, which would be one billion stars, and I can be horribly off, but that's still um, a factor of 300 more than, than the supermassive black hole. So once you're, once you're outside, say, a few parsecs, a few light years f away from the, from the supermassive black hole, everything else just sees a blob of stars, basically. And the mass of the black hole itself is just part of the whole mass that's there. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't influence the outer reaches of the galaxy. So I'm actually not super sure what the magical thing was. Um, yeah, Cameron would probably know this, but my guess would be that we just got better at simulating galaxies in terms of including more uh, better treatments of physics over time as they became more and more complex. It could have also been related to uh, resolution. I mean, what ultimately impacts the type the the morphology or you know the shape of the galaxy that you form is its merger history overall and if you know the merger history that you're seeing like how many little objects you were forming early on and how many interactions and mergers you're having are impacted by things like resolution then that would affect your final thing right maybe you're not if your resolution is very poor meaning that you have like say very massive um, gas particles or star particles and things like that, then, you know, you're only going to be seeing mergers between these more massive objects that may not end up resulting in this system that's capable of ordered rotation. That would be my guess. My educated guess, but still again. <laughs> more questions? Yeah, the, the reason is that they are waves. So, so the special thing about waves is that they're periodic. And in this case, instead of being you know, periodic in time, where you, know, you see something periodic in time, these are periodic in space. So as Nikita was saying, these spiral arms actually arise out of instabilities. And these, but the spiral arms are actually very special places in, the, in, that, uh, in those instabilities where the system is stable, so that you actually see them for longer lived phases. So these are special modes, special waves that, these, these are spe uh, well, sp special waves in space that allow stars to cluster around some region and 
be sparse around some, somewhere else. So yes, the, 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 the equal spacing is sort of a consequence of uh, the fact that these are waves that form these spirals. So to clarify maybe a little bit is that these these modes or instabilities that we're talking about they're like their density instability. So some places of this disk simply have a higher gas density than other places and in those places of course stars will predominantly form because the higher the density locally the easier it is to form stars. So that's why you see the stars in these spiral arms and then slowly they sort of drift out and form the rest of the disk. So the young stars we all see them in the spiral arms because that's where the density is highest. And then when they get older, they start sort of trailing if their momentum isn't exactly the same, more or less. Uh, right, so um, so, my, so my understanding, so the sun is not moving away from the galactic center, it is going around the galactic center. Okay. And that speed is about 250 kilometers per second. Okay. Around, so this is the entire solar system moving around the center of the galaxy at 250 kilometers per second. Around the center? Yeah, uh, it's, it, yes, it's circling around the center of the galaxy okay. at 250 kilometers per second. And the Earth itself is going at 30 kilometers per second around the center, around the Sun. So, and the galaxy itself, I think, is moving. So, if you, so velocities are always relative. Like, what do you like relative to what, right? So, and I think compared to the local group of galaxies around the Milky Way, the Milky Way's velocity is something like I think 500 kilometers per second, or maybe a, maybe 1,000, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 kilometers per second. So, if you yeah, depends on whether want you, you want to add that up. <laughs> but uh, yes, we are moving really fast through space. That's uh, yeah, 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 yes. uh, but we don't feel it because you know, gravity does not hold us together. <laughs> By less, what do you mean by less space at the galactic level? Well, this is what I, this is what I heard earlier. Okay. Yes, so what I said is that, like, relatively, galaxies are closer together. If you, if you compare them to their size, then, for example, I don't know how many galaxy radii, uh, for example, the galaxy, or the Milky Way and Andromeda are apart, but it's like, it's fewer galaxy radii than then our star is in solar radii from the next star. So in that sense, the universe is like full of galaxies and galaxies are not quite as full of stars. Um, why that is, I have, I, I'm not actually sure. Um, although galaxies do tend to group together, um, which is also true. Though there are also large empty spaces in the universe that where there is like nothing, but um, so, so these galaxies, okay, so Ivana, Ivana, um, you, you mentioned like the cosmic microwave background before. So if you look at the pictures of the cosmic microwave background, you already sort of see this, that there are these over densities that form sort of filaments in, in the universe. And those filaments, that's where most of the galaxies actually are. I think so you've the, all the galaxies are formed in these sort of density like well 
filaments, and especially at the at the, the knots of those filaments, you form clusters of galaxies, for example. And the empty spaces in the cosmic microwave background sort of translate to big empty spaces today. So there was at some point something about the, a big void somewhere that somebody saw. Super voids, we call them. Um, so I think the answer is, again, gravity. Um, the, the matter in the early universe was already sort of arranged in these, in these filaments, and those filaments are where the galaxies are now. So it's very possible that on a large scale, if you take into account all the voids, um, my statement was not true. But, uh, but I'm actually, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, just as an analogy again for why galaxies group together in terms of gravity, you can kind of think of it as the, the rich get richer and the poor keep getting poorer. You know, so you start off very early in the universe with, say, this galaxy that just has a little bit more money or more mass than, right, some other nearby region. And it's just going to keep on getting richer or more massive because of, of that initial head start that it had. So it'll just keep on attracting more galaxies to it, and that's why you get the formation of these things we call filaments, um, these groups where galaxies form and where most of the gas and material in the universe tends to be concentrated, and then these huge empty spaces in between. So if you zoom out to say, like, based on simulations, and we can also see some of this when we make pictures where a galaxy is just a single dot in this picture, you, you see something called um, essentially the cosmic web, you know, where it looks kind of like a spider web, and the web portions that you're seeing are where all the galaxies are, and the spaces in between are these voids. Yeah, so that analogy could also work. The bubbles keep on combining and getting larger, and then the places where there were no bubbles to begin just are out of luck. Yeah, so on, on the level of galaxy groups, um, they are gravitationally bound to one, other, one another. So, you know, Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to remain, you know, close together and keep on getting close together. But angular momentum is the reason that they, they still do remain separate. Um, so when, when you say on the galaxy level, do you mean inside an individual galaxy? No, 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 I meant, I meant in terms of these clusters of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is that uh, that when you have galaxy mergers, then these two galaxies just crash into each other, whereas we don't see that happening on the levels of a single galaxy, where we do see that you know, these are long-lived. They just keep rotating. They're not. So it is true that angular momentum is the reason why galaxies don't collapse into a central big object. It's because the angular momentum does, does not allow this gravity to collapse this entire massive system into a single object. but Angular momentum is also important in galaxy mergers. So if you saw some of the simulations that were shown earlier in the talk today, you would have probably seen that you know, two galaxies come in close together. They sort of pass by each other and they come back. The reason why they pass by each other is because of angular momentum. It's because the gravi gravity is trying to pull this, these two objects really close together, but the angular momentum is not allowing it to do it. So it crosses by, then stalls at a point where the gravity again becomes strong and it comes back. And you'd have you know, a number of these interactions you know, over a few millions of years until the, this angular momentum dies out and gravity finally collapses this entire sy binary system into a single galaxy. So yeah, that's angular momentum is the reason why 
uh, we see all these things. Yeah. So it is about 9 p.m. So that concludes the end of our outreach event as the whole. So thank you for coming to the lecture and also to those of you that you know stuck it out through the entire question and answers panel session. So I hope to see you at some of our events in the future and hope you have a good night.